Hey guys, so if you've been a subscriber of this channel for a couple years, you probably know that I have talked openly about the fact that I am a survivor of clergy sexual abuse. I was a victim of clergy sexual abuse. This is something I openly talk about because I feel very passionate about spreading awareness over this particular issue. I feel like there's a lot of people who have been in my position who have been sexually abused, especially by clergy, which is a fancy word for uh, church leadership, because I feel like I have an enjoyment of YouTube and speaking on mental health and things like that. I felt very called to put my message out there, put my experience out there, in the hopes that it will help other people. I'm no therapist, I'm no expert, I've taken some psychology courses and I'm working towards a psychology degree in college, but I am by no means even close to an expert when it comes to being educated and with a degree on the subject of any sort of mental health issues really. But I do firmly, firmly believe that there is a certain type of expertise and knowledge that only can come through people who have lived through an experience. It's not to say that those people don't have knowledge and expertise, they a thousand million percent do, but there's just a special type of knowledge and learning and education that can come from the word of people who have lived through an experience. So that's kind of the passionate um, opinion. I don't know if that's the word, but that's kind of the basis around this whole channel is I just talk about the things that I know, the things I experience, the things that are in my life and through my experiences and storytelling of those experiences or details on those experiences, it may help other people, if that makes any sense. So with the topic of my clergy sexual abuse, it's very touchy, it's very difficult. People do not like the word abuse. People do not like the word sexual abuse. They don't like videos like this that kind of talk about dark stuff like this that it could be very triggering for people but i i firmly believe that we need to be having these conversations they might be hard but we need to be having them so here i am one of the most effective ways i think that i can help educate people on clergy sexual abuse other than just flat out like telling my story this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened is to actually kind of mix together terms with experience here's a term this is how it played out in my experience so today i want to do that with grooming now before we get into it i did a whole video on my clergy sexual abuse i believe i titled it clergy sexual abuse and that was it i will put a link to that video in my description Go watch that if you're interested. So let's start by talking about what grooming is. Grooming in a nutshell is the process that an abuser uses to get their victim into a position to be abused. It is the different behaviors and things that an abuser will do to gain the trust of the person that they want to abuse. And there are certain patterns and behaviors of the grooming process that the abuser will use to gain that trust. For me, one of the first things that was the most most solidifying and most impactful on me and my family was uh, my abuser inserting himself into situations that he filled the role of like a caretaker for me and my brothers, of a loving, concerned person uh, when we had a death in my family, of being there for me as a loving, concerned family member or family friend when I underwent a major surgery. So that was one of the first most solidifying behaviors that he had in the grooming process was to simply be there for us and fulfill the role of a caring, loving, genuinely concerned person. This was extremely effective at building my parents' trust when this man from the church was there to pray with us and to visit and help out with anything that we needed when we were in a time of mourning, when we were in a time of great need, when I was physically just out because of this major surgery. Abusers will move in in your time of greatest weakness because that is when people are most easily able to be manipulated. It's the time when people are at their weakest, at their neediest, and if the abuser is there to step up into that loving role, the trust can be gained so much faster than when you have to just do a bunch of little things here and there. Now this is 
just pretty much a necessity. If you're going to abuse somebody in a manipulative manner, I'm talking in the cases where it's a trusted family member or a trusted family friend, Let's turn that off right now. You have to have this step. I was 17 at the time that my grooming process started. Um, the physical sexual abuse didn't happen until I was an age of consent. My abuser knew what he was doing. He wanted to avoid any sort of legal charges that could have been thrown at him. And so things did not take a sexually abusive turn until I was at the age of consent, which is like my least favorite term because it's been a nightmare for me um, in my healing process because that term, it's like if you're 18, like magically manipulative, brainwashing, abusive things that happen to you like no longer matter. It's like, but you were 18, cognitively your brain was that of an adult basically. So like if you didn't say no, then the law doesn't really care because you were 18. Completely throwing out the fact that there are so many things, so many ways that full-blown adults, I don't care if you're 40, can be manipulated and um, abused. As I said in my clergy sexual abuse video, but if you haven't watched it, I worked alongside of my abuser within the church. The abuser was a youth pastor. I was... A 17-year-old just graduated high school who was asked to help lead the youth. The building of trust not only is already there. With clergy sexual abuse cases, there's already a level of trust that's there because clergy, the church leadership, is a leader in the church and there's automatically a sense of trust there. You automatically assume, especially as a church member, that you can trust this person because they claim to be someone who does God's will, someone who has studied the Bible and who knows what they're talking about. So you automatically feel like you can trust the word of these people. And even for those people who, as we should, take things that leadership says with a grain of salt and does their own research, we all should do that always. Even if you're that kind of person, there is automatically a level of trust there. Then you mix that that's already present without any sort of relationship with the fact that this man um, took advantage of a death in my family my f that took a major toll on me and my parents and my brothers. And so that was like prime time, like move in, kill the weakened, the weakened antelope, whatever analogy you want to use. But moved in during that week time, uh, was made sure to be there for my family not just me, but my parents too, during that time where we were really, really struggling. So that built the trust not only with me, which is crucial, but another grooming behavior is oftentimes there's grooming that happens with the family. You don't want anybody interfering with what you're trying to do when you're an abuser. So you wanna make sure that the daughter's parents are on your side, that the daughter's parents trust you, that the daughter's siblings trust you, that her friends trust you because you don't want anybody interfering. You want everybody with the wool pulled over their eyes. Another grooming behavior that's very typical is isolation. So I was not isolated from my family in the way that you see in other cases where it's like they take the child or take the person and drag them physically like away. For me, it was like emotional and mental isolation. I was told things about family members that would lead me to believe in a subtle way that maybe they didn't have my best interests at heart, that they were out to get me, that they didn't trust me, that they are hypocrites, all sorts of things like that. Just little seeds that were planted here and there to make me feel like isolated from my family. Like I couldn't truly trust them, like they don't really understand me, but he does understand me and he does trust me. and. Um, things like that to kind of put a barrier between me and, you know, drive a wedge between me and people who may have been able to um, help and protect me from what was going on. Another grooming behavior that I saw in my situation was um, physical, like crossing physical boundaries. And this was even like in public. Like for me, it started with jokes that would be told publicly. So it was physical boundaries in the terms of jokes at first. So not like actual physical touches. Um, 
And as a 17 year old, at that age, I feel like no one really likes like a stuffy like church leader. And because this was the youth leader, like he was really good at being like cool and hip and he was in with the jokes. I mean, saying cool and hip is decidedly not a cool and hip thing to say. Nobody says cool and hip anymore. But he was cool, he was charismatic, everybody loved him, including the younger generation because he could make those kind of edgy jokes Things that were like borderline, like as a church leader, maybe you shouldn't be making this joke, but also like could fall on the like, he can, he made that joke, like he's cool. Like he's not so uptight. Like God has a sense of humor. We can laugh at certain things. We don't have to literally only laugh at biblical jokes. So things like that's what she said jokes. The office was wildly popular at the time. And so it was just little things like that. And I have learned through therapy and things that this step with sexual abuse is very, very, very crucial in the grooming process because not only is this person like slowly like achieving what they want, like jokes and then like touching and then like, let's get you in the bedroom, but it's testing the waters. It's telling the abuser, how well groomed do I have this person? If I make this edgy joke and she laughs or she reciprocates, good. Now we move on to the next step. If I do this and she reciprocates or she doesn't freak out, good. So then we move to the next step. It's a very, very effective way for them to kind of gauge how well their grooming is working. And one of the last effective behaviors that I can think of that I saw in my situation with grooming was I was given a lot of special attention. I fully believe I was targeted because I was the girl in church who didn't know how to say no. She was the girl in church who didn't have a lot of friends, was popular in the church because I was nice. I didn't say no. I was polite. Um, as my abuser started to get to know me and my family unit and the way my mind worked, I was given a lot of special attention. This was in the form of just this abuser feeding my passions, like I loved writing and this was something that he loved writing too. And oh, I'm such a great writer. He fed something in me. He made sure to say all the right things and praising the things that were important to me. And eventually it was praising my looks and praising my heart the way that, and he'd say things that were, anyone would wanna hear. Hearing that I was smart, that I was gifted at writing, that I was, incredibly sweet and that I should never let anybody change that. Like all the things that you want to hear, this behavior of grooming can happen with like physical gifts. But for me, it was just a lot of attention, positive attention and praise for the way I was living, the things that I was accomplishing. And um, that can be a very effective way of grooming someone. Now, to wrap up this whole talk about grooming and clergy sexual abuse in particular, one of the things that I think is important, important, important to remember is that the victim is not the only one that's groomed. As I said, my family was completely groomed and manipulated to trust this man. The man who abused me was married. He had a wife. And one of the things that was really, really effective in um, grooming me and manipulating me and, and confusing me and keeping me brainwashed was the fact that his wife went along with a lot of the early grooming. I'm not saying that she was part, a conscious part of the grooming process, that she knew what she was doing. Um, although I can't say that for sure she may have been in on it. I can't say either way. But I do know that when you're a 17 year old, Yes, cognitively, you do have the ability to see things that a child cannot. There were red flags that I did have in the very early days when, for example, I was called and asked if I wanted to go to his apartment to work on things related to church when all the times before we only met at church and, you know, red flags going off. Like, um, he always told me, like, we met in the church to be above reproach, like, to make sure that we were doing things the safe way. Should I really be doing this? And he even said you can come over when my wife's not here. I mean, major red flags. But then I hear her voice in the background saying, yeah, it's fine with me. Like, come over, spend time. Like, what? Like, it messes with your head because you're thinking, red alert, red alert. Like, this isn't fine. But wait, his wife is cool with it. 
And then I talk to my parents and then they're fine with it. Good abusers and these kind of deep, really tricky abusive situations have to have groomed all the people around them or else it just doesn't work out. There was grooming that kind of took place, whether it was intentional or not, from his wife. There was, maybe she was groomed. I, I, I have to believe that she was groomed. I, I don't really believe that she was in on it, but maybe I'm just naive. Just know that the grooming, you're not always just looking for it in the victim and yourself or the, vic the other person if they're the victim. You, you gotta look around because sometimes you might be suspicious of someone and then you think, but wait, their family trusts them. Like, look at, I mean, look at that Netflix documentary, The Abducted in Plain Sight. People think it's crazy the things that this man got away with. And after we turned it off and my husband and I watched it, I honestly was like, I feel crazy, but like that did not seem that unbelievable to me. I have firsthand seen just how convincing and manipulative and brainwashed people can get from a very good abuser, a very good manipulator. So to me, even though this man got away with like, like, wow, I was the daughter. My parents were the ones who had the wool pulled over their eyes in a much, 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 much less degree, but I've still seen it. So to me, I'm like, that's wild, but like, I don't think it's unbelievable. I can completely see how someone could get away with that. So you have to just always remember that in abuse cases like that are more complex, like clergy sexual abuse cases or um, certain child sexual abuse cases, cases where it's a trusted family member or friend, many, many times it's necessary. There's other people who have been groomed as well. It's not just the victim. So I hope that helped kind of bring some light to what exactly grooming is, what it can look like, at least in the case of uh, sexual abuse. And I really encourage any of you, if you feel like you might have been abused by leadership in your church, or you feel like you know someone that is, I would head on over to uh, thehopeofsurvivors.com. I They were helpful, very helpful to me when I was trying to work through all of my sexual abuse. Um, they post resources that you can use, testimonies. They're just a really good tool to help with the healing process. So I would definitely go check them out. All right, well, I hope everybody has a great week. And until the next video, I will see you later.